Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, uh, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing another really awesome guest today uh, involved in creating a better tomorrow for all of us. Um, today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. William Koresh, who is an internationally recognized expert on infectious diseases, wildlife conservation, the environment. Uh, he currently serves as executive vice president for health and policy at the Eco Health Alliance, uh, also as co-chair of the IUCN uh, Species Survival Commission uh, as wildlife health specialist group uh, member, and also chair of the World Animal Health Organization's working group on wildlife. Um, Dr. Gresh also serves on the World Health Organization's international health regulations roster of experts uh, focused on human animal interface and wildlife health. Uh, back in 2016, uh, he was appointed as an ex officio member of the uh, Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense, uh, also became member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and works with government agencies around the world and an invited expert for intergovernmental and developmental organizations, including the UN uh, Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, WHO, and the World Bank. Uh, Dr. Kresh has pioneered various initiatives over the years, focusing on the attention and resources on solving challenges, uh, creating the, by the interactions of, between wildlife people and their animals, uh, developing projects in over uh, 50 low to medium uh, income countries. Uh, in 2003, he is the one that actually coined the term One Health, uh, which we've talked a lot about on the show, uh, and to describe this unique interdependence of uh, ecosystem, animal, and people. Uh, he has an undergraduate degree in biology from Clemson, went on to do his uh, doctorate in veterinary medicine at University of Georgia College of Veterinary Medicine. Um, and we're honored to have him with us. Uh, a lot to get into today. Dr. William Koresh, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. It's great to be with you. Thank you for asking me on. Yeah, well, awesome to have you. Um, a lot of interesting themes uh, to get into. Uh, love to start off uh, by, you know, handing you the floor for a little bit, as we typically do, just to to further introduce yourself. Um, take us back a bit, Bill, to to sort of the beginning, uh, a little bit about your background and and what got you interested initially in uh, and not just biology, but uh, veterinary medicine. I think it'd be a great way to start out. Okay. Well, I grew up uh, down in Charleston, South Carolina on the coast and um, had a very outdoor life of growing up. And I really started working with little wild animals, you know, before I was 10 years old. When I was seven or eight years old, I had blue jays and cardinals and raccoons and squirrels. And um, so I kind of really kind of grew fond of of working with animals and particularly wild animals and certainly we had dogs and rode horses and all of those things a, um, a kid would do when given the opportunity to and i took advantage of that uh kind of later by high school and college i was also uncommon and uh, common like many kids you know, confused about what i wanted to do in life and and got it, oh, I need to do something to make a good living. I should be a doctor or a lawyer. Um, and I tried some of those things in school and didn't really find it that interesting and kind of found my way back into biology with a great mentor, uh, Dr. Sid Gotro at Clemson, who said, I'm an ornithologist. I love my work every day. It doesn't feel like work. Why don't you just come spend time with us? And um, 
and kind of led that shone light on the path that said, oh, I can actually make a living. I could have a profession doing this. Um, so I really wanted to move into wildlife biology or ecology. I found those fascinating. I loved learning about the world around me um, and hoped to get a PhD in one of those fields. But in the meantime, I did have to work to make a living. I got a job as a zookeeper at the National Zoo in Washington, D.C. Um, and I thought, oh, I could go to school part time. And I was a, got to take care of the giant pandas when they first came. And they trained me to be an elephant keeper. And I worked with hoofstock and uh, non-human primates. And I loved it. It was probably the best job I've ever had in my life. Um, Strangely enough, it was a hard time for biologists getting jobs. And um, one of my people I looked up to, Dr. John Eisenberg at the National Zoo, who is a research famous ecologist, said, oh, you're wasting your time. You'll never get a job. You should go to vet school. And I had never really thought about it and um, because I thought of vets as working with dogs and cats and cows and horses. So I applied yeah, with their encouragement, I applied to vet school at Georgia and got accepted. And I was like, oh, my, now I guess I'm going to vet school. Uh, but I didn't really lose my interest in wildlife and managed to have some great experiences in school. And then right after school in San Diego, I did a residency there and, you know, figured out a way that I could do both. I could be interested in, in wildlife and ecology and in medicine. And so that kind of la kind of launched my career. And, you know, you, you, you it's interesting because, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, in Charleston, the sort of the blue jays and the raccoons and obviously the sort of the more common animals that we we take to our vet. Um, but, you know, again, they don't teach you about every species in, in vet school, I imagine. And, and again, I'm, I'm I'm looking through sort of the, the early days of your your scientific publications here. And, you know, uh, I, I sort of see the assignments. Right. I say, hey, uh, they, they say, hey, Bill, you know, the, the elephants over here have salmonella. Uh, there's uh, something called the red ruffed lemur that needs to mate a little more. We got to figure out how to get them pregnant. Uh, the orangutan had malaria. Talk a little bit about that part of sort of the, the zoology veterinary connection, because I see, you know, in medical school, we learn about humans, but, you know, with you, you, you got to learn about the, the real unique nature of each of these species. Uh, you know, if I have salmonella, you know, I'm, I have diarrhea for a little bit and I'm in bed, but you know, when you have an elephant, that's different. <laughs> Talk a little bit about that if you would. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, each species and you know, we're talking hundreds of thousands, I guess, right. um, have their idiosyncrasies. Uh, but then there's also general themes. So, I mean, it's really a combination about learning uh, the similarities and then also getting exposed and being trained and taught about some of the, the dissimilarities or, as I said, idiosyncrasies. So, I you know, the best place to learn that is in a zoological park setting. So mm -hmm. I was very lucky to be at San Diego at yep. the Wild Animal Park. And um, at that same time, there was a postdoctoral residency training at the National Zoo. There were only really two at the time in the country, but more have grown up, um, giving young vets a chance to get exposed to a variety of species. And other than those settings, it's very hard to learn about a lot of species quickly. Um, and so you're forced to in that kind of clinical setting at the zoo, and you might see 30, 40, 50 cases a day when you're making your rounds and you're working and you're learning from the keepers and the curators. And so you have a, it's not a university setting, but you're around mentors and teachers all day learn, long learning and picking up on those things. So mm -hmm how to work with a spitting cobra safely and the diseases the spitting cobra might have, or we're doing a lot of work with iguana reproduction or yeah. lemurs, you know, prosimian primates. And uh, the people there have decades of experience. And one nice thing about that profession in zoo and wildlife medicine in general is that we or taught at an early age that none of us know enough to do this by ourselves and we all have to help ourselves. And there's also this kind of unwritten kind of rule about publishing your findings because mm -hmm. that's the only way for our colleagues to get good access. So I'm totally at the mercy in my work there upon the knowledge being gathered by my colleagues. 
And so we really support each other. It's not a very competitive field. It's very unlike academics or the business world where you want proprietary secrets so you can um, beat out your competition. In the zoo and the wildlife world, you don't, you're not really competing because you're working in different places, you're working with different animals. The competition is reduced, um, but the need for collaboration is very intense because you just can't know everything by yourself. So you're always calling on colleagues to help. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have this theme of, of conservation biology, and then, of course, conservation medicine, which you've written about, this the subspecialty that sort of connects medicine to the conservation of wildlife and ecosystems. And for several years, you, know, you participated um, in, in this field veterinary program for the Wildlife Conservation Society, really getting out there in the field and, and doing these rather comprehensive um, health assessments, let's call them, of, of a range, again, a, a range of species, everything from anacondas in Venezuela to, to penguins in Argentina and, and everything in between. Can, can you talk a little bit about sort of, because, you know, a lot of what's coming next in your career is in the field um, and, and, and really understanding sort of what's going on in, in the ecosystem with the wildlife. Talk a little bit about this era, because I think this is kind of important with how you went about sort of a, got a, a deeper dive into all these species, but really creating these comprehensive health evaluations of a lot of the stuff that's out there. Sure. I think at that point, uh, that kind of those decades, there was a, a grow, a real growth in expanding wildlife uh, research in general and, and the kind of shift from the observational research of watching with binoculars or picking up fecal samples or tracks and tracking, you know, following to a little more hands-on. So, you know, radio telemetry was starting to come about. So people wanted to be able to track animals, you know, um, without just following their footprints, you know, over long ranges. Um, there was a growing interest in genetics. So there's a need for more on hand, uh, hands-on kind of work with wildlife. And having kind of a experience with anesthesia, safe handling of so many species from that zoo world, you know, there are a limited number of people around the world. And you think of the zoo vets around the world of being freely available or easily available to come with that expertise to work with wildlife biologists who have that kind of ecological background. So I kind of moved into this world of helping wildlife biologists where they work, where I would go for two or three weeks um, just for that kind of handling part. And they had much longer term studies where they would track or follow these animals for years, um, but they needed a little help in the beginning or in the middle of their project to put on a radio collar or to get some samples for genetics. So it really kind of let me experience a lot of different field projects in a short number of times. So when you think about the number of countries I've been blessed to work in, yeah. um, but, but even more so the number of great field biologists and conservationists I've gotten to work with around the world and to learn from and learn about their studies and why they designed them that way. And what are they doing beyond research you know, for conservation and to be able to learn from them in the field? really a you know amazing wealth of knowledge and and opportunity for me just building on that you know getting back to what i was saying about that um commitment to sharing what we're learning with our colleagues yeah you know, the opportunity was there it was like well while we're doing this why don't we take a blood sample why don't we learn about what diseases they've exposed to we're catching the animal anyway for a radio collar you know for just a little more effort uh, we can collect proper samples and look at toxicology, look at serology for exposure to infectious diseases. And so having access to sites around the world really led to that kind of rapid growth. So where you're mm -hmm. saying a uh, health surveillance of scarlet macaws in the Amazon or uh, mm -hmm. Impala in Namibia, those are very simple little add-ons that were not very expensive. The big cost is that time and effort to get there and and to do the big project, do the major research project. So the add-on for the health part is really minimal, um, and it's kind of a collateral benefit. Mm -hmm. I think that kind of theme keeps coming back on and 
And we could talk about that a little more with uh, when we get into the One Health yep. dimension. Yep. yep. Yeah, and that's that's exactly uh, where it's going next because you know in the in the late nineties, uh, you know, around the turn of of, of millennia, you, you know, you you're publishing a lot at this point on on zoonotic uh, conditions, you know, and arboviruses and lentiviruses, and, and we mentioned the the orangutan with malaria and all that, um, and and you introduce you know. The world sort of this theme of one health and and uh, there's this you know really important article you write in foreign affairs on the human animal link and obviously at that point you know there's a lot of things happening that you know are introducing humans to this concept in terms of SARS-1 and avian flu and mad cow disease and all that talk a little bit about that era and and, and you know what happened obviously you came up with this term but I sort of introducing it to the world uh, to take us back to the beginning there sure so you know, in that process of being out with uh, conservationists and biologists around the world, you also naturally create a network yeah. of uh, of people that you trust and you rely upon, and they and it's um, and it's mutual. And myself and my colleagues, uh, you know, started being asked to do more and more about uh, when their disease outbreak. So. You know, ten years before that, or even twenty, you know, we, there was a time in wildlife biology where we thought of diseases in wildlife as natural, just like forest fires were natural, and we would just let them burn. A forest fire burn; it's a natural occurrence. Um, diseases in wildlife are natural, and you shouldn't interfere. There shouldn't be intervention, and that was a really nice thing. For hundreds of years when there was unlimited wildlife or unlimited forest um, and we had little impact but you know by the 21st century we're having a major impact and animals can't recover populations can't recover they can't move they can't immigrate as easily um, there's a lot of fragmentation so it seemed apparent that we had to start thinking a little more about intervention strategies even though it was uncomfortable for a lot of people in the field um, to shift from being a journalist to a active participant, kind of you know, that kind of analogy. Do you just document the destruction of the planet or do you do something to intervene in it? And there's and that was not an easy shift, I think, um, for biologists in general to make, just as journalists don't step in and try and rescue every child as they're trying to document the story. I mean, it's, it is, it's a hard thing to do, and I understand that. But it, it needed to be done, and more and more people wanted. So we had things like the um, outbreak in of measles in the mountain gorillas. And mm -hmm. measles, you know, is typically found in humans. It was not something... Um, often seen in great apes, except maybe occasionally in a zoo setting uh, where they're exposed to kids with measles in some way. Um, but there was an outbreak in mountain gorillas, and there was a lot of time about, well, we should be vaccinating mountain gorillas. And that actually was done to uh, to try to protect them from it. Um, people were worried there at that time there were maybe three or four hundred mountain gorillas left in the wild. Um, so they could have easily been lost. There was a lot of conflict about that intervention. Should we let nature run its course? There's pros and there's cons to that um, argument. I kind of was looking at it a broader view because um, I was never really interested in just one species of animal or humans looking at a broader view. And as we started to identify that the risk of measles and gorillas was really coming from unvaccinated human children. So, you know, I was thinking, you know, yes, of course, I'm not opposed to vaccinating the gorillas, but wouldn't an additional and maybe more beneficial thing in the long run was to support vaccination of children in these areas around where mountain gorillas live? That was somewhat a heresy at the time, you know, for a veterinarian to be advocating for human vaccination. Maybe I'm being a little dramatic on the heresy thing. But, you know, most fields were always fighting for more money and more attention for what we do, not for what other people do. Okay. And I kind of felt like, and this is really kind of that beginning of One Health, was to think about, about how we cross um, disciplines and areas of expertise 
um, and sectors of society to help each other accomplish goal, you know, goals that have mutual benefits. And I think of those as collateral benefits. So I could say like, well, rather than funding me, another person to go vaccinate gorillas, I still think gorillas could be vaccinated, but you don't need me. Why don't you use that money to support human vaccination? And I'll support Doctors Without Borders or World Health Organization. Let me speak up about their need to get support to have better vaccination for kids. And it's not going to benefit me, but it's going to benefit gorillas. And if we all do that for each other consistently, we're going to have a lot of collateral benefits and a lot of mutual benefits in the long run. And that was really kind of my thinking about the beginnings of One Health. And I know it's generally interpreted as, oh, diseases moving from animals to people or people to animals. That's really kind of easy for most people to understand. And that's the low hanging fruit. Um, but the real core of this One Health is bringing more people to the table to solve problems mm -hmm. and bringing people with different areas of expertise and being supportive of each other instead of, once again, competing with each other, saying like, well, my area of expertise is more valuable for this problem than your area of expertise. I just think society, across society, we have a lot to add to this problem solving. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's, you know, it's, it's, that fits very nicely into where I was going next, because um, I think one of the first people I talked, you know, about sort of the One Health theme with was um, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Jimmy Desmond over in Liberia at, uh, at the Chimpanzee Rescue and Protection Group. Uh, and he, you know, uh, we, we, we talked a bunch about chimpanzees, but at the same point, he, you know, introduced the fact he's a consulting veterinarian with Equal Health Alliance and specifically with the focus on, you know, looking at what was happening with the Ebola and, and, and all that. Um, be, before we get into some of the different programs, you know, along those lines, and we can talk a little bit about Liberia and all that, um, introduce us to Equal Health Alliance. Uh, a little bit of the, the background of the organization, uh, you know, sort of, the, you know, tagline, developing science-based solutions to prevent pandemics, promote conservation. So, you know, everything happening at the intersection of One Health. Um, take us a little back, you know, a little bit of your responsibilities, uh, you know, as executive vice president and, um, and then from there, we'll we'll head into to some of the, the specific programs, types of things you do. Okay, well, EcoHealth Alliance um, is, I mean, it's really all in the name and it's really a focus on ecology and health. And that alliance part of the name is really important because the way we're structured, the organization structured is really about partnerships around the world uh, to work together and getting the job done. So rather than having thousands of staff and offices and headquarters everywhere, uh, we have thousands of partners yep. work from their home base. And they might be a small NGO in their country, or they might be at a university, or it might be a government agency, a fish and wildlife agency in another country, or the Wildlife Authority, or the Ministry of Health in another country. And we just find partners that are interested in the kinds of work that we're interested in and what can we do together. And we build our programs and projects around that. Mm -hmm. um, my role is in health and policy. Um, I guess it's just captured there in the title, but somehow bridging some of the research that's being done um, and using that to inform sound policy. I, you know, I think most people in the policy arena in the world, you know, come to understand that uh, policy decisions are actually rarely made on um, facts or science, but, you know, human policy decisions are actually very um, emotionally based. Mm -hmm. So you want to go in with your eyes wide open because the facts always don't steer us in the direction of where the policy goes because Policy, by definition, is about politics, and politics is about people. Um, and there's a, a heavy emotional component to that and an economic component that drives the, how we feel about things. Mm -hmm. uh, so you do have to kind of be aware of that. I think the One Health piece fits in again there um, in trying to connect all those pieces. So the science and the research is incredibly valuable, uh, but those input from other groups and other sectors and other stakeholders is critical 
if we were actually going to have a kind of a robust approach to informing policy and helping good decisions to be made. We have to think about the economics. We have to think about human behavior. We have to think about the cultural components in any given setting. Um, and we are lucky at EcoHealth Alliance to, you know, have great partners. We don't work in countries where no one wants us to work. We you know, work at the invitation and the good graces of, of local people and local governments and local organizations. Um, so we don't try to push our way in um, anywhere and try and work upstream or it's not an uphill battle. We tend we work, you know, where people really want to value what we have to offer. And if we can bring in some um, ways of new ways of thinking, or we can bring in uh, other partners that they might not be exposed to. We might have access to financial resources that they're not able to, or come up with a creative way to find some support that they need. Uh, so it, it, they're truly good alliances and partnerships. Yeah, let's please. Yeah, and the organization itself. So you know, we kind of. They are actual projects. We have, you know, some brilliant scientists that are doing really high quality research for science and gathering information. You know, that's that information part, gather information. That's not the same as knowledge. Um, and then we have a really good um, team of people that do a lot of analytics. So you kind of synthesize that information into something that's getting closer to knowledge. Um, and then we have you know, people that really understand uh, socioeconomics and working with people and have those people skills to really kind of put that knowledge into a context. And that's, again, where our local partners really play a big role because they have that local context. They go like, well, this is what people are really concerned about. So can we make sure first that the research is relevant to what people in that country or this place are really concerned about. It's not just interesting research, but it's actually useful for somebody <laughs> um, because it is fun to do interesting research and it's easy that it's not necessarily useful right away. Um, but we like to kind of make sure that there is some utility and use at a local level or at an international level. Mm -hmm. And then how to get that message across. Um, what do people what are they, what are their concerns, what are their priorities and their concerns, and how do they do it now, what are they willing to change, what are they really attached to, and we're going to have to find another way. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's, it's a rather, you know, extremely comprehensive uh, portfolio of things that are going on, and obviously we'll put the link to the organization in the bio of the show, I, I thought we could just like, you know, touch on a couple of, I, I, we, we talked about Liberia and, and, and Jimmy Desmond. So I, I thought we could hang out in Liberia just for a few, for the examples. There was two really um, interesting programs, one uh, called What's the Fever uh, and another called Forest Health Futures. And again, you know, uh, because sort of coming at the One Health thing from, from a couple different angles, one uh, in the sense of, you know, uh, uh, normally when, uh, a fever, you know, flares up somewhere in Liberia. You normally they normally think about malaria or typhoid, but uh, obviously could be a, an important predictor of, of any type of, of zoonotic uh, event happening. Uh, and then sort of the, connected to this with the Forest Health Futures Program uh, here in, in, in West Africa, especially Liberia, you got a, a tremendous amount of, uh, of sort of the the, the forest cover that's been lost over the last couple of decades. Uh, again, that has highlighted important things like hey we didn't we didn't normally think we have Ebola and Marburg to worry about around here but now with the forest gone as you were saying we're getting a lot closer uh per the one health connection talk of take a little time to just talk about these two programs if you would because I think they uh are very interesting in, in the kind well that they are sort of the same country but sort of connected in that very unique way in terms of her people and then the environment and, and we talked about the, the chimps before, but a very important eco, you know, sort of connections there. <laughs> yeah, they're actually they're exciting projects and 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 quite different. And yeah. they might touch the edges probably touch a little. Uh, so the what's the fever? Um, as you mentioned, it's really focused on what are, what's missing? What are we not seeing? You know, what what so Liberia's been very impressive, especially post of Ebola, was most people in the country, I mean, huge percentage of people in the country 
became very aware of the risk of emerging infectious diseases because of the Ebola outbreak. And the national public health system certainly uh, went through a lot of trauma and also lost a lot of staff, nurses and doctors and people working there. So it was a, a traumatic experience for the country, but in the, they've come out of that with a very strong awareness of what potential risk could mean um, if they're not under control. So it was a good time to say like, okay, you know, malaria and typhoid are really common. Traditionally for the whole 20th century, if somebody had a fever, you just went ahead and treated them for malaria in Africa and those parts of Africa and sent them home and, and s said, good luck. And a lot of times they got better. Don't even know if it had anything to do with the treatment. They might've just gotten over whatever they had. And so we wanted to take a look there and go, well, what else you might be missing? There might be some easily treatable things. And there are a lot of infectious diseases that are easily treatable and often ignored. So there's a common one, leptospirosis. We see it. It's all around the world. It's probably the most common zoonotic disease in the world. <clears throat> How many people are just getting leptospirosis, have a fever, you can give them tetracycline and they would recover. So some really kind of simple things and how can that feed into the national public health system? Um, so when they're looking at people, they have a longer list of possibilities in their head about what this could be. And could they do a little diagnostic test that would help them identify those things? And we've seen that in other countries and Southeast Asia, that disease, leptospirosis I mentioned, accounted for about 25% in some cases of febrile diseases. It was just going uh, miss, misdiagnosed. So why not you know, give a chance in Liberia? The Liberians were very interested. They were like keen to do this. They kind of like, wow, we could be actually be under treating or miss, you know, not treating people for the right thing. It's not that hard. And we'd love that kind of information. So again, we have this willing group of people that want to partner. They want to learn. They want to do a better job. What's it going to take you know, to do that? And we could match them up with um, funding programs that operate internationally. They're interested in helping in those kinds of things. So it's a nice partnership. And we can look at those diseases and people, and we can go to their communities where they live, and we can sample animals at the same time and see if there's a presence of zoonotic diseases that match where the people are getting them, or maybe they're getting them somehow else. But there's more community engagement. So you get people thinking in the communities about how to prevent being exposed to some of these diseases, whether it's not handling these animals, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's not um, butchering them, you know, and with their bare hands or what they could be doing or washing their hands. It could be simple hygiene that would reduce their risk and letting that whole community be engaged. Another component of that one health is that um, health is not owned by medical doctors. It's not owned by the World Health Organization. There's a, all of society is engaged in health, um, and we need to bring in all those partners. And I often say, you know, as in, I can't remember where I, who I should be attributing it to. I feel bad about that. Um, but you know, it's often said that if you're not part of the solution, you're not part of the problem. Um, you are part of the problem. And that's commonly. And then, um, but the real truth is, if you're not part of the problem, it's hard to be part of the solution. So we figured, you know, you need to really bring in, we need to bring in the people that are part of the problem if we're really going to come up with good solutions. It's not the a bunch of smart people sitting in a room 2,000 miles away coming up with solutions when they're not even part of the problem. So it's very, you know, I just want to move away from that. It's really about the people engaged. So if we're, I know people are upset about the oil industry getting too engaged in climate change, but if Part of the problem with climate change is about the fossil fuel industry. We need them at sitting at the table. We can't just like yell at them from a thousand miles away and expect a real solution to come from that. So I think that's that kind of engagement there. Mm -hmm. That forest health program as conservation works is a very yeah. interesting different strategy in that there's um, been a long time shift and really in a need for creating more protected areas. And Liberia's got some of the 
richest, most diverse forests left in West Africa. And they were kind of spared a lot of deforestation just because of the lack of economic development. So lucky for them, sorry for them, they haven't benefited from economic development. Lucky for them, they still have a lot of forests. Um, so they could come into protected areas, but you know we are in the 21st century. So we're thinking protected areas don't mean that people have to stay now poor and they, you know, we can have both. Mm -hmm. So this is really thinking creatively about creating protected areas, but local people still really benefit and have economic development. Again, it fits in. It's like, well, people that were 50 years ago thought of as poachers and they're cutting down the forest and they're the bad guys. And we are sitting over here in America. We're the good guys. And we're going to come over and fight the bad guys. And it's like, that's just not working. That has not gotten us where we need to be. So you know, that kind of one health thinking and USAID, in fact, said we want protected areas developed and we want it built around the theme of one health. And one health in that context is, again, engaging people from different sectors and different areas of expertise. Um, you know, what's the education ministry what are school teachers what could children be involved in how could th these forested areas actually help with education but also that educate education in those schools benefit protecting the forest are there little uh industries that are non-destructive to the forest be developed and non-consumptive use of forests uh tourism could be built in there could these be uh training sites for conservation biology and the local local people benefit by that by you know um serving meals or producing housing or you know running small camps and those kinds of things that so can have this again these collateral benefits instead of just winner takes all yep. that you know oh, we're going to make a forest kick every you know does the national park kick everybody else out and good luck to you but the forest is protected so like you know, how do we get mutual benefits, collateral benefits? And that project is really impressive. And we can go in, there is a true health component with um, actually working with park rangers and training the rangers how to recognize the signs of diseases emerging. Are there animal, you know, see animals uh, dying or a few, you know, how to collect data on that, how to report that in, notify not just park management authorities, but notify the agriculture department, notify the public health department. So everybody's aware of what's going on. Can we all work together? Maybe the public health department can provide free laboratory testing and the parks authorities are providing, you know, the salary for the rangers and the agriculture department can provide something else. So you get this kind of partnerships and you start exploiting these, um, collateral benefits, because those benefits end up adding up to way more. The, you, the economic benefits are much higher than the cost of doing that protected area of the park. So you have mm -hmm. to really tease those things out to show those benefits. Once again, getting to these policymakers who are going like, oh, this is actually not costing us. It's actually a huge economic benefit. This is an easier decision. And if local people are excited about it, it's easier for them to make those decisions. That's a real policy change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you um, you mentioned, you know, early on the the case of the um, the gorillas and and and, and the measles, and um, it, it got me thinking um, a bit about the uh, about a, it's about two years ago now. I, I got to spend some time with uh, with uh, Lin Fa Wang. Mm -hmm. um down in singapore and, and he introduced sort of this theme of of uh horse vaccination with the hendra outbreak and and that nasty virus that that popped from bats to the horses to humans um which was quite a successful sort of wildlife vaccination story um a little different obviously than than the measles going to the grills but obviously we can't vaccinate all of wildlife but there are targets no. out there that make sense um, I had uh, Gladys um, Kalema on last year, and you talking about the hippos that unfortunately you know got COVID. But um, what's you know what is the appropriate place for 
wildlife vaccination programs. Obviously, we we, we the, the megafauna are prob probably easier to target than you know what the cheetah or, or whatever the case may be. But um, talk a little bit about that. I, I think it's kind of an important theme that we don't think about as much as we should. Yeah, I th certainly think it has a role. It plays a role. And there have been some, you know, I, I hate to call them examples. It might be all the cases, you know, you, we can count them on a couple of hands. It might not be, there might not be 10 examples. There might just be 10 cases um, of where this has really been effective. But it, um, they're few and far between. But when it's it, when it's done uh, right and where people are smart about when to do it and where to do it, it can be very effective. So, uh, in general, you know, developing a vaccine, people think of that as, as you remember from the COVID, and we had, uh, you know, huge billions of dollars put in there to move it quickly. It can be a slow and expensive process. Um, sure. on the other hand, it is also, um, understandable was is, is not really inventing anything that new it is not sure. a, a tremendously wicked problem that we no one can get their head around so it's you know it, it serves its purpose and it can serve its purpose and it can be easy so um there's different ways to look at it like that horse the vaccinating horses um for those hendra viruses makes a lot of sense horses i mean they're in a stable. Somebody's got them on a lead. You know, not hard to access them. It's not the same as vaccinating wildlife because um, you have them in hand. So a vaccine, sure. you know, children, you just grab them by the hand. You take them to the pediatrician. There's not much. Use. It's not like you have to run around the playground trying to right. vaccinate kids as they're loose. Right. Uh, so that would be the more. <laughs> that's the wildlife analogy. Is you have to go dart children at the playground in order to vaccinate. <laughs> you don't have to do that. Um, but on a wider scale, I mean, so, some of the best um, work that's been done is controlling uh, rabies in foxes in Europe. Yep. Um, and we control rabies in, in raccoons in North America with oral baiting. So you can drop baits that have the oral vaccine in it and the animal chews it up. Um, that's taken a lot of fine tuning over the year. And it's also... Um, it doesn't work without a good understanding of the ecology and the behavior of the species. So you know, at one time they kind of estimated for Europe, we're just going to have to drop baits across all of Europe to vaccinate every fox and they're born every year. So I mean, you're talking about, you know, like billions of animals every year forever, um, which is a kind of a crazy concept, but their biology is the foxes are very territorial um, and when they die of rabies, the new foxes move in, and so they might bring rabies too. But if you bait like in a barrier area, those animals don't die of rabies and they defend their territory. So you don't have new foxes moving in. So you can kind of create a move a buffer around where people or domestic dogs are, and you can kind of move that buffer zone back over time to kind of slowly move towards elimination of rabies in wild animals and foxes yeah. um, with a good strategy, understanding the ecology of foxes. Mm -hmm. So you can't do it with the vaccine alone and you can't do it with the ecology alone. Once again, right. it's about two groups that wouldn't naturally just be talking to each other, getting together and going like, oh, well, actually there's a very viable solution if we take the knowledge from here and the knowledge from there and put it together. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's some nice combinations there for vaccination. It's it's challenging. It's fraught with challenges, but it is in human vaccination too. Um, and there's always things we have to come across. The the viruses might change a little, so the vaccines aren't as effective. Or there's reluctance to it. You know, I talk to some people that hunt and eat wildlife, and they go like, "Well, ironically, you know, we might think." Someone might think it's ironic, but the, a lot of hunters tell me, like, no, we want our wildlife natural and organic. We don't want them vaccinated. Mm -hmm. So you've got the Whole Foods guys 
think the way of thinking in Whole Foods also in the hunting community going like, oh, I'd actually prefer not to uh, eat vaccinated animals. So there's a lot we have to really still delve into. And once again, you have to engage those groups if you're ever going to be successful. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, speaking about getting a lot of people at the table, um, I, I've over the year profiled you know, several of your uh, commission uh, members uh, per the bipartisan commission on biodefense. Um, you know, you had an active role there. Um, would love to hear your perspective on you know just your involvement with with the initiative and a little bit clearly. Um, you know, there's not unlimited funds, but uh, a Apollo moonshot. Uh, everyone wants everyone wants moonshots nowadays for their thing, but clearly an Apollo moonshot uh, for biodefense and and sort of you know obviously the connection to One Health uh, would be ex extremely useful in this world of lots of scary things out there in nature that potentially come in our way. Um, talk about your you know your time on the commission and a little bit about you know you know if the hundred billion dollars. <laughs> fell from the sky tomorrow um what do you what would you like to do in terms of um uh, you know further uh utilizing the one health knowledge to buffer us in, in terms of uh biodefense issues in biodefense yeah it's really been a pleasure and an honor working with the group on the biodefense commission for people not familiar with it, I urge you to kind of go to that website. It's a bipartisan commission on biodefense. So it's trying to span across U.S. politics. It is U.S. focused and um, and it's really about national um, biodefense and biosecurity. And it comes from, you know, kind of roots about um, originally about the threats, you know, over decades about bioweapons and, and, and bioterrorism. Um, at its core, and so it kind of fits in that world of defense. But again, I think everybody is seeing that some of these things are unintentional as they come about. So we have uh, the COVID pandemic, or we have flu pandemics, and the ch when you really look at the data, um, those are much more common. Um, these things that come from human activities and I and people like to say put them into categories about natural and accidental and uh intentional as these bio threats you know, so was it done on purpose or was it a lab accident or is it natural I'm kind of moved away from using the natural term um so you won't be hearing me say that anymore. I have kind of basically two categories, which are unintentional and intentional. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these things don't really are not very natural. I don't think, the, you know, we have avian influenza and this kind of bird flu avian influenza has come around from the way we produce poultry. Mm -hmm. um, that's not a natural thing. You're nowhere in nature did anybody have 2 million chickens on a farm <laughs> in nature? So these are all things that have come with modern civilization. Um, so I wouldn't say that influenza outbreaks are natural or Ebola outbreaks are particularly natural. Um, it's about what people are doing that they didn't used to do. And the risk has changed because of urbanization or international trade or globalization. There's a lot of human activities that drive these pandemics or epidemics. Um, so I just say those are unintentional. And Mother Nature had little to do with that. It was mostly about humans, but no one meant to do it. No one's thought about, oh, if chicken is cheaper and protein, you know, we can feed more people. And no one said, yeah, it's fine because, yeah, we'll have pandemics, but it's worth it. No one makes those. That's a very, those are unintentional outcomes from the things we do. And we just have to make them safer. And I think with the Bipartisan Commission, it's been good to bring those together. Um, what you do about them to prevent them is, is different. Um, but what you do to respond to these things is very similar. And that's about beefing up. Um, diagnostic systems and technology for rapid diagnostics, mm -hmm. technology for rapid response, vaccination treatments. So in the end, you know, the 
the bulk of this work about what to do after the outbreak has started is is very similar and it might as well be handled because there's tremendous cost savings in doing it at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so I, I try to play my you know, role there um, is to remind people about the ongoing risks from what people are doing around the world and, and hence the need to be prepared all the time. And we can use these technologies in the meantime so people can get in practice. I mean, you don't want a surgeon only doing surgery once a year. I prefer to go to a surgeon that actually does surgery a few times a week, is constantly in practice. <laughs> so we have epidemics and outbreaks you know, there for different diseases going on all the time. And if we kind of invest in kind of the systems, the, the structure for public health and the structure for agricultural health, and they're working on disease reduction and risk reduction every day, every week, um, all of that then transfers to when we do have a pandemic. We don't have to start up from scratch each time we have a pandemic to figure out who to call and who to talk to and who can help. Absolutely. Um, so moving to a um, another interesting topic, um, it's I guess it's it, it, it's somewhat what health connected, but um, uh, just a. About a couple of careers ago, um, I was involved. I was involved in a, a project importing this um, this interesting uh, something called grains of paradise from West Africa, a species of ginger. Uh, its Latin name is Aframomum meliguetta. And um, at the same time, there was this uh, situation happening, and it was the early two thousands where there was several gorillas. Um, that these are the Western lowland gorillas. They were dying of something called fibrosing cardiomyopathy uh in the zoos and zoo. there was yeah there was and there was this interesting connection made that there was these interesting i call them uh medicine or natural medicines that, that the gorillas were you know dealing with in, in nature that they were getting and and when you did the pharmacology on this stuff it was all you know all sorts of pro-inflammatory cytokines and other factors that, uh, that this uh this herb was useful for um and it gets me thinking of this whole topic of uh sort of uh, not just pharmacognosy but sort of it's term zoopharmacognosy about all the interesting things that we could potentially learn from our our wildlife friends uh potentially for not just how they 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 stay healthy, but uh, potentially applications in the human sphere. Any interesting sort of zoopharmacognosy stories that uh, you've run into uh, over the last couple of decades as you've been uh, playing around with all these unique species? Um, I I'm not so sure. I mean, I've oh, I hear those stories and then I see it, and you certainly when you're in the forest and. West Africa, you see where they've been eating those ginger plants or kind of monocot that plant right. and chimpanzees too. And they pull them down and they eat the pith out of it. And, um, and you can see that I, I have no idea how that plays into their heart health. I know, you know, heart disease in gorillas is, uh, in captivity is, uh, a huge problem. Right. Um, and, my colleagues that work at zoos will probably hate me, but I, I'm still not convinced, you know, what exactly those connections are. I do know, I mean, I'll just be somewhat non-scientific, um, if you'll allow me to. But in a zoos and gorillas, generally speaking, all the way, you know, until very recently, you know, they are 50 to 100 pounds heavier than what you saw gorillas in the wild. Okay. Well, interesting thing was all through the 1900s, the 20th century, people, you know, were studying gorillas in the wild, but never bothered weighing one. Um, and they're nice and fluffy and hairy. So they look big like a gorilla in the zoo. But when we start actually handling them, um, for projects and, and collecting information on their diseases, we also weighed them. You're like, wow, they look big, but they really don't weigh that much. And they're lean and muscular. They just look like um, Buddhas with the big belly because they're you know full of eating vegetables all day and, and leaves and vegetables. Um, but they don't really weigh that much. And um, 
compared to gorillas in the zoo. So you the gorillas in a captive setting, you know, were getting probably too much food and too rich of food for less and doing a lot less activity. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know how much that contributed to heart disease. So that's where I'm saying I'm being pretty unscientific. I hope I'm not offending anybody. There could be actually really good reasons why they get that uh, specific disease, that fibrosis and cardiomyopathy. There's a lot of theories about that. They're really fascinating. I'm not sure they're correct um, when I read about it. Um, And that's not the disease we see in humans. Um, But you see other similar heart diseases in gorillas that you do see in humans. And, and those have been pretty much linked, as in humans, with, um, with weight and diet and, um, and activity and exercise. And not, not so strange. The other thing is, I, you know, it's hard to think. You know, there's some really cool work on medicinal plants and chimps that select for okay. certain to treat themselves, potentially for parasites and yeah. things. I, I, there must be knowledge and value there though you know that bioprospecting where people have gone out for decades yeah. found interesting plants and drugs um it it is fascinating i think it's fascinating um but it seems like now in modern times it's it is a cost effectiveness and efficiency in syn- synthesizing hundreds of different analogs using artificial intelligence to or generative AI or, or actually machine learning to figure out which ones are the best prospects mm-hmm. that work on cells. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's a lot um, faster than tromping around the forest and talking to people. And in West Africa, it's very interesting. In Africa in general, a lot of the medicinal plants are just things that make you throw up or get diarrhea. Um, and they work because a lot of the illnesses there, you know, a lot of basic things are foodborne, you know, toxins, mm-hmm. poisons, bacteria. So, you know, that's why people learn to use those plants that made them either get diarrhea or, or throw up. It actually did help them. Um, there's no reason to belittle it. It's actually very effective for the kinds of things they had problems with. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I forgot that you know Ipecac is uh, it oh, comes yeah. from some some cardiotoxic vine. Yeah, I, re- I remember that now. From, I, but yeah, no, that, that, that's uh, no, I appreciate uh, uh, you know that insight. Um, but what, one last thing I wanted to ask you about while I have you, and I really really appreciate the time. Um, when I was going through your Google Scholar, I, I noticed a really in- well, actually two interesting sort of WHO reports that you were involved in. Um, one which is entitled Connecting Global Priorities, Biodiversity and Human Health. Uh, and then uh, specifically chapter 16, it was entitled Integrating Health and Biodiversity Strategies, Tools and Further Research. Um, you, you talk a lot more about sort of the importance of biodiversity's connection to human health beyond uh, One Health and Infectious Disease in this report. And I'd love for you just to, you know, as we get close to the wrap up, um, what what is your future vision for, you know, obviously biodiversity is extremely important. I feel personally, it's very important to get out there in nature. Um, what, what do you see, you know, as we sit here in 2024, what are sort of some of the other um, important areas that we should be investigating in terms of uh, the human biodiversity connection? Well, the most obvious, of course, is uh, climate change and the climate dilemma. And biodiversity is, you know, square in the middle of that um, because the drivers, uh, the, a lot of the causes of biodiversity loss are also linked with um, the drivers of disease emergence. Some of them overlap with with the drivers of climate change. So again, we can come up with some working together. You know, we have group, big groups of stakeholders in each of those categories that could be working together instead of competing for resources. And we could mutually have these kind of more mutual benefits. And so uh, the mission of one organization might be, you know, really focused on climate change, reduction, mitigation, and another is looking at biodiversity, another can look into health. And so 
they wouldn't naturally think where they should partner, but if they did partner, they could affect more change because they would be each going towards their mission, but they have some shared goals in there buried amongst their missions there. So I think there's room for that kind of, I mean, I put that squarely as one health. Mm -hmm. I just, that's just clear as a bell to me. Mm -hmm. Um, I think on the biodiversity um, front, I mean, there's a few ways to, you know, to message uh, that, but um, I think that biodiversity in the environment sector, and I talk to a lot of people in environment ministries and government um, that are just starting to come around to, it, and they like this idea that the environment is essential for health. Um, but it, it, it's a no-brainer to me. I mean, we want to look, look at a picture of Mars and look at a picture of Earth, and Mars has no biodiversity. And I know some people are thinking about it would be cool to live on Mars, but I would choose that picture of Earth any day. <laughs> you know, where do I want to live? And a world without biodiversity is a pretty barren, bleak, horrible, you know, kind of situation, at least my bias, having grown up on Earth, I'm kind of like attached to air you can breathe and trees and, you know, grass and sand and beaches and water you can drink and those kinds of things. So um, I, I think there is no health without biodiversity and a healthy environment. It, it just underpins everything. So I always find it interesting to go to meetings and the environment people that were there, the wildlife people there, and they said, well, you know, this health stuff's really none of our business. And I say, well, I really beg your pardon. There would be no health without the work that you are actually doing. You might be, you know, think about it in another way. Um, and I, I would say that we can keep finding those things. You know, we don't learn anything from just looking at things the same way. Um, you know, and there's so many of our expressions, you know, like the other side of the coin or, you know, turn over the rock, look underneath the rocks to find, you know, of course, if you're just staring at the top of the rocks, like everybody else, you won't see anything new. You lift up the rock and you say like, oh, look what's under there. So I think we have to keep uncovering things, turning things, looking at things the opposite way. The environment is actually the root of all human health. It's not you know, some nice thing that we get to enjoy if we're healthy is actually the opposite of that. Um, and so I think, you know, the more we turn things upside down and look at them from a different angle, once again, I think that part of One Health about bringing in people with a very different view, they're coming in with a very different um, opinion and a view, enriches our efforts to actually make change and improve things. We can't do it if we just talk about all, all we just talk amongst a bunch of people that all agree. That's, you know, that's yeah. how what got, that's what got us here. Yeah. So we're going to have to do things differently. Yeah. Bill, what's, um, what's coming up for you, uh, for the rest of 2024? Um, things we should be on the lookout in terms of public facing initiatives, conferences, talks you're going to be giving, um, anything else <laughs> on the calendar that we should be aware of while we have? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, don't follow me around. I just, <laughs> well, actually you could, because you could follow me around because I go to learn. I'm just trying to learn new things every day. So yeah, everybody's welcome because I'm going to go spend my time trying to learn new things from other people. Um, so yeah, maybe it's not so bad. You can follow me. It's not to learn from me, but you can learn with me from, I, you know, I, I'm pretty picky about where I'll go spend my time, but I will, um, I'm still very actively engaged in projects in uh, Western and Southern Africa and in the Middle East. We're doing some great work in Jordan, uh, looking at um, occupational health and safety, people that work with animals and what's their risk and how do we reduce it. And, in Southern Africa, we're doing some fun work with um, with the South Africans on vector-borne diseases and Rift Valley fever. And in the process of that, it's a big problem actually for, for livestock. So the sheep farmers and the wool growers association have all gotten involved. They really kind of love the work. And it just started out as like, oh, how can we reduce this zoonotic disease? But it has such an economic impact on these industries that they've all jumped in and wanted to 
get it interested. There's a big one health Congress and um, in the fall in South Africa um, week after next, I'll be uh, working with the world organization for animal health. We have our mm -hmm. wildlife meeting, but there's a general session for all the agricultural delegates. Uh, they'll meet in May and, and address some of the issues. Some we're seeing uh, avian influenza, influenza is you know, linked typically to birds, but that's also affects humans. And we've seen these massive die-offs of seals and sea lions in South America, and then now getting into Antarctica uh, with mm -hmm. penguins. So that's really new and devastating. And then this week now we're hearing about it in the U S and cows and maybe some goats. And, um, so when it starts to get into mammals, you know, that's a bigger threat that it can get into people. Um, so those are like warning signals that are flashing um, and trying to get more attention on that and, and talking to people and bringing it up at kind of at, at higher level with uh, decision makers. I, I understand it's hard for them to move out on a limb. We use that expression a lot too. Um, but people forget that going out on a limb means that, you know, that limb might break and you might fall mm -hmm. and die. So this is why, you know, we, we use that term very casually, but there's inherently that term in here, you know, as a implied risk. And you can see why um, people in positions of responsibility are reluctant to take that yeah. risk, you know, um, because they are a potential cost. So we just have to try and make them feel more comfortable and help them justify why, you know, why it's important. That's what I'll be doing. Excellent. And then I hope, hopefully you'll use this and I'll be coming out on your podcast. Yeah, we will. Uh, we will definitely <laughs> get it uh, live as soon as possible. Um, I'm, you know, going to look forward to continue to follow uh, what you're up to. And, and as the group moves forward with all these programs, again, we're going to put the, the link in the bio of the show. So, so people can check all this out on their own, but um, again, um, for everybody that's uh, going to be listening to uh, this particular episode of our show across the various podcast networks uh, or who will be watching on our YouTube channel, uh, again, you've been listening to Dr. William Koresh, Executive Vice President for Health and Policy, EcoHealth Alliance, uh, co-chair uh, IUCN, Species Survival Commission, Wildlife Health Specialist Group, and chair World Animal Health Organization Working Group on Wildlife. Um, Bill, I want to um, thank you uh, for taking the time out of your schedule uh, to, to talk to us for a little while today on everything you, they've been doing and that you're up to. Uh, obviously, thank you for what you do uh, in the One Health context. And as we like to say on our show, you know, thanks for helping create a better tomorrow for not just us, for all the wildlife out there via what you do. Really a great story. Oh, thank you so much. A pleasure yeah. being with you.